the sin of riba. It is by far the most underestimated of the seven destructive sins of the Mubiqa. Zina is very obvious, adultery and murder and you know stealing. And you think about these types of sins and you think horrible. But the Prophet ﷺ mentions that one dirham, a penny of interest, is more grievous in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than adultery with a family member, than incest. So if someone sees that someone's engaging in riba or someone's engaged, ah, oh, no big deal. But the way we shun zina or adultery or murder, or alcohol, these other prohibitions, right? There's a problem here. And we have to ask ourselves, why are some sins normalized to us and others not? And don't claim that it's Islam. Why are some sins more disgusting to us and abhorrent to us than not? Why would riba be worse than zina? Why would riba be worse than adultery? And Imam al-Baghawi rahimahullah said on a societal level, he said, when the economy collapses, when the poor become poorer and the rich become richer, he said the rich become more prone to zina and alcohol and corruption and lust, and the poor become more likely to dwell in their sorrow in those very same sins. Isn't that interesting? The rich indulge in more fahisha, the poor indulge in more fahisha. Fahisha are the shameless sins. The rich because of access, the poor because of sorrow and depression. So they're likely to find, you know, their escape, you know, in that brown paper bag, the cheap alcohol in the brown paper bag, whereas the rich are likely to find their joy in expensive bottle of vodka. But he said that the collapse of inequity that riba causes forces people into those directions anyway. So subhanAllah, he, I, I thought that was a very powerful way to address this, that it pushes people in the direction of all of those sins. He also said because people don't take riba, or some of the scholars mentioned, they, they don't take it seriously. They don't take riba as seriously as we just mentioned, which is very obvious to us. And also the scholars mentioned because riba hurts and harms at a much greater scope than the other sins. So riba causes more societal harm than those other sins that are likely to really just shame a person's self. You're contributing to a system that continues to impoverish and continues to lead people to a very bad place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions, if you look towards, and it's the sequence, if you look at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, second chapter of the Qur'an, there's a verse of charity, a verse of riba, a verse of charity, a verse of riba, a verse of charity, a verse of riba. So Allah is drawing a contrast between people who spend in charity and people who deplete others through the practice of usury. It's interesting. So Allah mentions, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَ Those who spend from their money in private and in public, day and night, لَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ They have their reward with Allah. They're not seeking a reward in this world. They have their reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهُمْ they're not going to be afraid, they're not going to grieve in the hereafter, right? So Allah is praising these people. The next verse is the verse about riba. There's a verse about people that engage in usury. Why is that? Why is that? Societally, if people do what they're supposed to do with their charity, then those who would typically have to resort to paying interest don't have to do so. If the system is functioning properly, where a person that cannot afford education has people that are spending on them anyway, where the system is built in a way to take care of those who would typically need to resort to an unfavorable contract, then you don't have to resort to riba. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about it from a societal perspective. This is what happens. You also have on the individual level when people embrace that, that when people have money, they view it as a burden. This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do I need to do with this money? So they give from the money rather than the greedy person trying to grow their portfolio. The person who gets and who feels that sense of, uh, of debt to Allah will spend day and night privately and publicly. The burden is on the rich to give, not on the poor to squirm. Right? And that's really what we see. To, the burden is on the rich to give. They're the ones that are afraid. They're the ones that are out there trying to look for the poor to give to. That society was created with the Prophet Sallallahu message. It happened. It lasted. That was a situation that did come about in certain Muslim societies. The rich feel the burden, not the poor. And that's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates through this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives this example of the person or says that the one who consumes riba, the one who consumes usury, will not stand on the day of judgment except like the standing of a person being beaten by his devil, leading him to insanity. Then the next verse mentions, or four verses later rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبِ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ That if you don't give this up, then 
be ready, prepared for a battle with Allah and His Messenger This is what Ibn Abbas said. He said, on the Day of Judgment, the only one that would stand in this state, being beaten literally to a point of insanity every time he stands up, is this person. He said, not even the disbeliever would be treated this way or anyone treated this way. This is a person who deals in riba, standing up and being beaten into insanity. And then after he's, be he's been beaten into insanity, He's told, take your weapons and prepare for war with your Lord and with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Can you imagine that state being told, the war now starts between you and Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala protect us from being in that state. So there's the individual, then there is again, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ riba wa yurbis sadaqat. Allah destroys riba and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala increases charity. A system can survive without riba. A system cannot survive with riba. The global economic collapses. Look at what the cause is because we're constantly building upon this bubble and then eventually the bubble pops because it's imaginary money. It's not really there. A system that is laced with riba is a system that's meant to fail over and over and over again. It's a system that is that will lead to bitterness and that will lead to poverty and that leads to uh, great economic disparity and all types of things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ riba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys riba. وَيُرْبِ sadaqa. Linguistically, the word riba means increase. The word zakah also means increase, but the word zakah means increase with purification. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith from Ibn Mas'ud it's an authentic hadith. He said, there is no person who deals in riba, meaning to increase their wealth, except that he will end up with qilla, with a little bit of wealth. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually deplete his wealth as a result of his increasing in that wealth. Now did the Prophet ﷺ understand that there would come a time where riba spreads? Of course, all major sins spread and all of these things take over. And he mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa that there would come a time, even a person who does not consume uh, riba, some of its vapor or its dust will reach the ghubar, it will touch him somehow. Even if you try to stay away from it, somehow you're going to be engaged in it. If you have a bank account, you're engaged in it. Even if you don't want to, but you're engaged in it. You have a credit card, you're engaged in it to some capacity. You're always somehow going to be touched by that system. However, it becomes a point that we don't knowingly engage ourselves in riba in any way. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said that Allah curses the one who consumes riba, the one who gives it, the one who witnesses over it, and the one who writes down the transaction. And they are all equal in the sin. And all of them are equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this takes away this idea because people downplay more, than, more so than taking riba, people downplay paying riba. There are very few Muslims who would be shameful enough to actually take riba, but to pay it because you're forced in a situation. So the shamelessness of taking it is one thing, but to pay it, well, I've got this, well, I've got this, well, I've got this. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying they are all equal in sin, even those that are affected by mutual consent. 